environmental justice and health. Um, I hold a bachelor's degree in GIS and computer cartography and a master's in applied meteorology and climatology. At this center, I lend my expertise to many projects, including communication, education, research, and in the mapping tools core. Um, so I will pass, on, pass the mic to my colleague, Eli, um, so he can introduce himself. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Eli Straussman. I'm a graduate student at the University of Maryland College Park, I'm getting my master's in uh, GIS. And uh, at the lab here, at, um, the Environmental Justice Lab, I am the developer of most of our mapping tools, including the one you're going to be seeing here, um, and provide uh, analysis and uh, statistics uh, for a lot of the work we, we do. Um, in this session, we will be discussing the center's My Block Counts Community Block Assessment Tool. Next slide, please. So what will you learn today? Today, we're going to learn a little more about environmental justice and community science together. Um, we're going to explore what shapes our communities. We're going to also discuss the role in bringing data to people. We're going to also look into how our tool conducts block reviews. And also, we're going to examine another resource that is helpful in advancing the environmental justice movement. Next slide. So throughout this um, conference, we've been hearing a lot of different perspectives on environmental justice, what it means. And it's important to note that it is not a, an abstract con concept, but directly relates to all of us within a community. Um, from some of the sessions in day one, I've seen and I've heard that it's very important for our youth, it's very important for day-to-day um, -day folk to be able to have a say and um, contribute to environmental justice movement and how we can further advance the movement moving forward. So that's exactly what this tool is going to um, help in help do in communities. Next slide. So as we begin this presentation, I want you to think about some things that you like and some things that you dislike about your community. And just think on that for a couple seconds, but hold that thought because we'll be circling back to it. Um, but definitely think about the things that you like and most importantly, dislike about your community. Next slide. Um, so something that um, has been very important in advancing the environmental justice movement is community science. So community science refers to work and research done revolving environmental health by those of the general public, you and I, not just environmental health workers, researchers, and scientists. Um, there, are, there are a lot of pros to community science. Um, so one of the pros is community science allows for a vast amount of data collection and a way to intersect the general public into the scientific process. So an increase in data collection can potentially equate increases in studies published, increases in solving issues, and increases in hypotheses and theories that can be tested. Um, the range of work for most individuals wanting to get involved is vast. There are so many options. Anybody can do it from, from um, a, a, see more, more senior citizens um, to more youthful citizens. Anyone can do it. Next, please. So with, with that, we can move into what our block assessment tool actually does and what that means for the community. So a community block assessment tool allows for community members to participate in science and that science empowers in them individually and collectively. And that is what my block counts does. Um, it also utilizes an environmental benefits district framework in order to quantify pathogenic and salutogenic infrastructure within a community. We'll come back to those terms, just want to get through this, and then we'll get, get those definitions right out to you. My block counts also allows for users to collect data under nine domains related to the built environment. And these domains include block features, stores, housing, industry, physical disorder, public services, transit, 
public safety and policing and health. The tool guides users through a series of survey questions related to the above domain to capture the nature of the, the built environment quantitatively. So by tallying both harmful and beneficial neighborhood features, community members are able to use this collected data to essentially better understand how their neighborhood block contributes to community health and to advocate for resources that can lesser in, lessen environmental health disparities. Next slide, please. So before we move into how the actual tool works, it is important to understand that planning and zoning shapes all aspects of our community. Next slide. So um, some definitions. The plan planning is the design of cities and other areas. It mainly focuses on management, the use of the land, the use of roads, buildings, and so much more. While zoning includes the laws, the laws that determine how space is used in a community for human activity and development. Next slide. So this is, right here we have a graphic that demonstrates different features of a neighborhood and planning, oh, sorry, sorry, uh, apologies, sorry. Features of a neighborhood based on planning and zoning in communities. Um, so as you can see, there are street trees, there are building heights, um, job locations, fast food locations, open space and parks. We know that these have different effects on different populations and essentially furthering, causing different effects, different health outcomes, apologies. But you can see that communities can be very diverse in terms of some of these features, which are essentially controlled and regulated and influenced by policy and community ad advocacy. Next slide, please. So I want you to take a look at this, this image. Um, what do you see? What, what are some things that are sticking out to you? Some things that um, definitely are not sitting well with you and just think on it for a minute. So what I can see from this is there is uh, the pr proximity, the close proximity to housing, from the housing to the road. Um, there is an abandoned tra tractor trailer in the background with um, some graffiti on it, um, some smokestacks, there are power lines, um, definitely some things that aren't necessarily beneficial to, uh, or, or healthy in general, to, um, to people growing in communities. Um, if there are kids around, you know, there's, there's, there's smokestacks very near and, you know, smoke um, children are very much affected um, easily, most easiest, and um, senior citizens by air quality issues. So these things are controlled by planning and zoning. Do notice the lack of trees, the lack of green spaces, um, the lack of other other amenities that um, are essential to a growing neighborhood. Next, please. And now I want you to take a look at this image um, and just ponder on the the differences you see in this image versus the other image. I'll give you a two two seconds to kind of take a look and absorb it. Right, so there's a big difference. As you can see, there are trees, there's a bike lane. Um, it doesn't seem like there are any nearby um, house, um, smokestacks, um, no other visible environmental hazards. Um, parking is also something that's on one side, houses are looking, there's a sidewalk. So all of these things are important to um, the structure of neighborhoods. You can do the next slide. So in within the the my block counts tool, we've incorporated the um, environmental benefits district framework, and this is um, essentially made up of several components. But the overall concept is 
moving communities, is wanting to move communities from environmental injustice and inequitable risk to a state of environmental justice and flourishing. So as we take a look at this model, on the left side of the model, we see that there's a high abundance of social um, pathogens. And pathogens are aspects of the community that do not promote health, do not promote environmental or economic prosperity. And some of these examples include coal-fired power plants, landfills, liquor stores, um, title porn business, and fast food restaurants. Also on the left side of this, we see a low abundance of health-promoting salutogens. So salutogens, some examples of these include grocery stores, well-maintained parks, community gardens, banks, libraries, and the list goes on. As we move from left to right, you can see from this model that the pathogens decline and risk is reduced as salutogens rise and give way to equitable development. Within the left wing of this butterfly, um, we see five components of the Environmental Benefits District Framework. Um, so some of these, um, of, yeah, sorry. So some of these components um, include smart growth, transforming neighborhoods initiatives, and economic enterprise zones, health enterprise zones, and zoning and planning policy. And all of these components it all in some way influence the planning and zoning of communities and in turn influence socioeconomic and healthcare status. Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier um, in the previous slide, salutogens are good and pathogens are bad. So the aim is to increase the amount of salutogens in your neighborhood, but also have some sort of data recording um, the pathogens in the neighborhood so that you can essentially aim to reach a status of having more salutogens than pathogens in your community. And what better way, like who knows a community better than the community members? So this is why using this tool is so important because this is, you know, some, you know your block most, you know where you've grown up for 20 years most. Somebody from a bigger corporation coming in may not have the background details like you do, you know, and sometimes you don't have the background details as well. So it's important for you to pay attention, for all of us to pay attention so that we can do our own part as individuals and as a community to ensure that, you know, we're doing the best we can in these spaces with whatever access and um, resources we have. So next, next question, next slide, sorry. So now that we've got that out the way, um, we are gonna move into using the My Block Counts too. Next slide. Um, so essentially the My Block Counts tool is a block assessment. So this is a tool that allows, as I mentioned, community members of all ages, all abilities, um, from, with all, any different set of skills, to conduct a detailed scan of their neighborhood um, and to also identify, document, docu identify and document different conditions in your natural and built environment. So as I mentioned, um, in this context of addressing environmental injustice, community members are often tasked with providing proof. So this block assessment essentially allows you to input data, save it, and that data can then be used to essentially, you know, um, move forward in communities, at, um, send on to different policymakers. Um, just that data can be used to advance efforts that have been maybe lacking in different spaces. So the, the block, assessment, block assessment uses community-based participatory research, which is a collaborative community-based approach to research that equitably involves community members, organizations, and all aspects of research, research process to support the review and assessment of the neighborhood. We are currently in the stages of creating a downloadable smartphone app that can be actively used by community members regionally 
and nationally, and who knows, eventually internationally. As it stands, this is a beta two version of the app. However, we you can use it on your phone, you can use it on your laptop, you can use it anywhere. Um, and this was designed um, using Arc One Two Three Survey, which is an application of ArcGIS that is powered by Esri. Next slide. So before you start your block assessment, we have some tips. You should be alert, definitely look left and right and look left again because when you're crossing a street, you never know what may come out the way and we don't want anybody to get hurt. Um, you can work with a partner, you can work with a team, you can work individually, individually. You can do it anytime you want. You can, you, there's no rush, it's on your time, your pace. Um, when, you, when, you, when you finish, you can talk about what you found when, with other people. Again, you can, you can talk to yourself. You can speak with community members. You can, you know, it's something that is very inclusive. Um, so once the user has completed the survey, you would be able to access the data set and utilize it in tandem with other members in your community. And through training and collaboration, community members, again, can become community scientists um, with this information needed to advocate for improved and additional infrastructure, and ultimately towards a more environmentally just neighborhood. So now we are ready to complete your block assessment. Shall we begin? Next slide, please. So welcome to my block counts. This is the welcome page of the survey. And so this is page one, and what you would just do is you'd press next and you'd enter the survey. Next slide, please. Then on the page two, um, users are prompted to add general information about your block. Next slide. Within this next page, page three, um, you are going to also add your space and place. So when we think about environmental justice um, with respect to our, our space and places, we often focus on our zip codes, where we live and where we eat, they matter. It all matters. So it's important to include spatial information in the app so that you can identify which neighborhood um, according to the data that is inputted. Um, so the third part of the survey asks about the physical attributes and geography of your block. Um, it is able to capture your, your starting location by either your address or street intersection and log that data into the survey to later be viewed. Next, next slide, please. Um, this is my location. <laughs> so what essentially after you click on that map, you, you, it zooms in and captures your exact location. Next slide, please. So within the same page, it's just important to actually define what is a block. So for our application, we define a block as the space on public, public health lane between Wilson Avenue and Maryland Avenue. So when you're out on the street assessing your block, don't forget to check both slides. Slides. Not slides, I'm sorry. Um, next slide, please. Right, so as I mentioned, we're still on page three in the survey. We will get a chance to do um, a demo of the tool with Eli, but I just thought it was important to actually move through this, this in slide form before we reach to that section. Um, so page three is continued. Um, page three of the survey is still continued, and it comprises of nine different sections indicated by different tabs. So each of these tabs represents a group of questions related to things that you might encounter on the block. So as you can see, there are block features, stores, transportation, industry, physical disorder, health, public safety and policing, policing, I'm sorry, um, public services and housing. Next slide, please. So, Within those same menu options, I will briefly go through um, each, each option um, that is provided on the, the survey. 
when we speak on block, fe block features, um, it includes a description of the overall street layout and street network. So what does this mean? That includes how long the block is, how wide the streets are, how are there sidewalks present, um, how about trees, how many do you see, and so forth. Um, stores provide information about the types of stores and businesses on the block. The industry option refers to areas designated for the purposes of manufacturing activity. Physical disorder describes the process or factors by which communities fall into physical disrepair. Um, next slide, please. The housing option refers to types of places where people live. Um, public services refers to places where we learn, we worship, we play. Transportation provides information about the types of public transportation on the block. And health provides information about the types of medical and health services that are available on the block. The public safety and po um, policing features include police stations, pr um, print ads related to tobacco, um, security alarm companies, signs of vandalism, and the list goes on. Those are just a few examples of what each option includes. Next slide. So we did include this. This is a new feature in the app. Um, we did include this because sometimes there are things that aren't necessarily able to fit into those nine options. So we just decided that we would say it was miscellaneous or other features. And these include um, information about structures that are vacant, um, some that have been broken down, inoperable, inoperable, inoperable vehicles that are just laying stagnant at the side of the road, trailers, non-residential properties, and so much more. Right. So step four, after you've filled in your location, um, after you've entered your general information about the block according to the nine, well, 10 essentially, 10 different options, you will click and then share the results. And then you have just completed your own block assessment. Next slide, please. And I am now going to hand this over to Eli so we can move through and do a demo of the tool so you can actually see how it looks um, on actual screen. Awesome, thank you. And thanks everybody for joining us here today um, for our first public beta. Congratulations to everyone joining us. You are gonna be the first public beta users of um, the My Block Counts app. Um, so like Ariel said, um, this is going to be able to be accessed on any uh, device that you might have handy, um, including, you know, your smartphone, uh, tablet, or PC, laptop. Um, so I invite anybody who's able to, to click on the link, or um, yeah, click on the link or uh, scan in the QR code. Um, we'll leave it up here for a couple minutes so that people who can can get their phones out and, and get it up. Um, if you need a quick tutorial on how to get the QR code, just pull up your phone, pull up the camera app. Um, if you have an iPhone, you can just point it at the screen. If you have an Android phone, you might see some things at the bottom. Scroll at the very end where it says modes. Hit lens. And then point it at the QR code. And that should pop up a link that you can tap and it'll bring up the uh, survey if I let it get in focus. Let's give it a few minutes. All right, go to the next slide, please. Oh, right, there is no slides. It's all on here. I forgot we're using this. Do you mind switching to my screen? Thank you. Um, all right, so like Ariel said, this is the first thing you're gonna see when you open the My Block Counts tool. A very important thing to uh, remember is that until you submit your survey, um, it will automatically bring you back to the survey you, you started. Um, 
we are at, going to add in a feature in the release that will allow you to have concurrent surveys running. So you can do a survey on your block, and then if you have, don't have time to finish it, you can um, go. You can still start another survey on another block if you just happen to be there. Um, so we're just going to hit next. <clears throat> These are very important safety tips. So we're just going to make sure that they're right up front so everyone can, you know, community safety is first and foremost. So we want to make sure that while you're doing this work, you're able to, you know, stay safe. Additionally, um, the community data only is helpful when the community uses it. Um, so working with people in your community and talking about the results and things you see really makes it more of an impact than, than you may recognize. Um, most people aren't aware of issues in their community until somebody brings it up to them. So here we're going to see the um, space and place section. So um, as you can see, the map will, pu will pop up. Um, you can tap it, and it'll uh, ask you if you want to use your location. If you don't, that's fine, and you can just type in any location that you'd like here. Um, this is the only required question in the survey, which means you cannot proceed until you've put in an address. Um, the uh, reason for this is obviously while maybe having a personal record for your reference of the block features is, is helpful for the community at large, it really isn't until you can you know, pinpoint it to a geographic location. Um, if you don't have um, capabilities to get a location on your device, just pick the nearest address or cross street that you can see and just use that. Um, it doesn't have to be 100% exact so long as it's on the block that you're reviewing. And that's very important. Um, you make sure that the address that you enter is on the block that you are reviewing. And as we move along, we'll see the um, questions um, about the block features. So we have this, what is a block? Just as again, just for a reference, um, blocks can be different lengths, right? Um, which is, you know, our first question. Um, as we move on, it'll just ask you very, um, you know, immediate present questions about your neighborhood and about the block itself. Um, all of these questions are editable as um, you proceed. So if you make a mistake somewhere, don't worry about it. It'll you can go back and, and fix it. Um, the survey is not able to be edited after you submit it. So anything you anything you see after you hit submit won't be included in that survey. You can always add in an additional survey for the same block. In fact, that's Hopefully, what we will get is a lot of surveys for the same block, so we can see, you know, how the community sees itself and the different features there. So we're going to just keep scrolling down. It obviously has as many physical features as we could consider. I'm sure that we have missed some, and um, I welcome anybody if you, while you're doing this, if you see anything that is um, very uh, uh, a glaring miss please, please, please put it in the comments so that we can add it in. The community input is going to be really important to improving this tool going forward. And we're just going to keep scrolling down. These are all the bins um, that you'll see in order to, uh, for the main portion of the survey. Um, every single time you edit something in here, um, it's going to be saved on our um, server. So currently it's being hosted um, through Esri, um, through the UMD's um, association with Esri um, on their cloud servers. But uh, once it's once the official version is released, it's going to be hosted on a separate site um, that is uh, controlled by the Environmental Justice Lab. And the reason that's important is it's going to be able to allow us to include this information and our other tools and allow the public to be able to use this information as well. Um, so we'll keep moving down. So these are the various stores. Um, anything that um, 
anything that is on the block. Now, it's important to remember that if you're standing on your block and you see across, you know, laterally across the street, um, a store that isn't on your block, right? That that would be on the next block over, um, which might seem like a very minute difference, but um, it is very important to try to keep our data as accurate as possible to the exact location that you're um, reviewing, okay? It is um, inevitable people are going to make mistakes, obviously. Um, but our goal is to try to make it as, try to minimize the guessing that you are that you would have to do while you're filling out this survey. And additionally, if you don't see anything on here, you don't have to fill it out. If So if there is no shops on your block, you could just skip this entire section, right? And we're just going to keep scrolling down. Um, so next we're going to go, we have the transportation and it's very similar. So I'm not going to go through each and every one. Um, the same basis of data integrity still stands. So it's really important just to make sure that you're reviewing things that are just on your block. Um, so metro stations and bike lanes, if they're on the next block over and they stop at your block, they do not count as being on your block. Um, of course, the opposite is also true. So just try to be as um, observant as possible. Um, and not, rather than going through each and every bin, um, just very quick review of the different um, of the different factors we're trying to consider. The um, as we move down towards the list, you'll see that it's mostly talking about, as Ariel mentioned, uh, pathogens, um, because that is, as I'm sure many of you have love for your communities, and there are still things you would like to improve. Um, and this allows us to and allows community members to track those things that need to be improved. Um, but it should be also, you know, it should be um, kept in your mind that even while you're trying to track all of these things, you know, you shouldn't lose your love for your community. And you, and you should really try to, uh, you know, appreciate everything you have here. And this is just to help make your community better which is, you know, always great, right? Um, so just quickly just scrolling through everything. Um, like I said, if anybody sees any glaring mistakes um, or mishap, misses, please, please, please let us know. Um, the public beta is going to be available for um, the next week. So um, leave until the 19th. Um, so you feel free to add in data and save it, um, mess around with it. Oh, see, this is what I was saying. You have to answer this question or else it won't go through. So we'll use the University of Maryland College. Look at that. And even though I did not answer a single question, it will still allow me to proceed. Um, and the last section are just those miscellaneous features that were kind of hard to quantify, um, but nevertheless are still very important to, to recognize. And at this point, you'll hit the submit button. Once you hit the submit button, two things are gonna happen. As I mentioned earlier, your information is going to be um, locked up and you won't be able to um, edit it again. Um, that again, you can still add in another survey for the same block. That's perfectly acceptable. It won't lock you out from adding in more surveys. Um, another thing to um, that's going to happen is it's going to send this data to um, the My Block Counts um, layer or map rather. Um, and what this is going to do is this is going to allow us to visualize and um, include this information, this very granular specific information in our other tools and allow community members to have a more clear and coherent way to kind of see all of the information that's being collected. Um, this will be able to be integrated into basically all of our um, environmental justice tools um, 
So while it itself does not, um, while it itself is not going to, is not an action um, to create, to in further environmental justice in a direct way, this is immensely helpful on the back end to give everybody context and and information on how to on what their what is going on in their community. Um, so yeah, anyways, you would hit submit and then you're taken to this portion where you're allowed to, you know, go and create more surveys. And uh that is it. Um so let's look at the I'm gonna look at the questions real quick. So um might be difficult to estimate the length of a block. All right, good point. So um, we can the we can see if we can maybe put a more clear ledger and maybe um, hmm. do you ask residents how they feel about their block? No. Um, what does what would you mean about that? Just in terms of like a general like or dislike um i think that oh we do not but we can definitely add that question in there um is there a criteria for food blanks on my block and churches yes both of those things are in that app you can app users see the results from their blocks and look at other block survey results they absolutely can um so as i mentioned towards the end there all of the information that's going to be um sent through this app is going to be um, publicly available. And um, that's going to allow community members um, to kind of engage with the data in a more hands-on way. I think um, a lot of people can recognize that most, that um, a lot of community data that is valuable to a community is not very easy to assess and understand for the average person. Um, it's my job and I find it difficult at times, right, to figure out what is important and what is not important. Um, so that is um, kind of what this, the gap this tool is trying to bridge is the difference between the that high level data that is collected by you know government agencies and the actual personal community experience of, of people in the um in the community um so with that i'm gonna i'm gonna pass it back to my colleague and thank you everybody please please if you have more questions we will have a q a section at the end too so if you have more questions about the um application send them Great. Thank you so much, Eli. Um, that was extremely helpful. Uh, definitely going through each region. I mean, each section, I'm sure everybody, um, it seems like by the questions, like everyone is excited to use it and apply. So with that being said, um, I'd also like to speak on whether, or introduce, I should say, um, another resource that um, has been um, developed to uh, further advance um, environmental justice. So get, get the get the word out there. Um, so we've recently um, created the My Block Counts Environmental Justice Podcast. This podcast takes a deep dive into environmental justice issues, impacting key counties across Maryland and the many considerations and disciplines of public planning of the environment that distribute to different health outcomes and the overall well-being of underserved communities. Um, it is hosted by Dr. Sokobi Wilson, um, the director, of course, of Siege. And we have partnered with the WIPR radio station in um, metropolitan Baltimore. So essentially, um, the My Bell Counts Environmental Justice is dedicated to, um, just this podcast is dedicated to helping people know so they can grow and help things flow in our communities. That's actually the tagline. Um, so, Episodes will cover air quality issues, climate change, health issues, water issues, heat issues, redlining and segregation, environmental hazards, including Lulu's, 
proximity to hog farms, underground water storage tanks, the list goes on. And throughout these episodes, Dr. Well, we, we see, or rather we hear, we hear our host, Dr. Sukobi Wilson, have conversation with guests from different environmental agencies, grassroots groups, et cetera, um, regarding these different issues and, and how as individuals we can, we can work within our communities to just do better. Um, you know, um, we have linked the first episode um, of the podcast in the chat, in the, the, the question chat. And this will also be up on our on CJ's website. So the first one just came out. Um, we do have um, consecutive episodes coming out for the rest of the year. So listen and stream away because it definitely, you know, you get a lot of information from from each podcast. Um, they last about 30 minutes. Um, and it's just definitely something that um, it's essential, you know, when you turn on the radio, when you when you click the podcast, it's available via Twitter, it's available via other social media platforms. And it's essential to at least if we can't get access or gain access to everyone, you know, why not use social media platforms? Why not use this to get the word out? Um, so on top of the My Block Counts tool, we have the My Block Counts Environmental Justice Podcast. And just a quick, quick note on the on the 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 graphic for the My Block Counts podcast. This is actually modeled after um, a redlining map of Baltimore. And so we kind of try to fashion it off of that map so that we could include that into the, the meaning of the podcast, not just have a, a, a graphic or an image that just has no connection. And so, you know, definitely keep a lookout for those episodes. Um, they will be out generally monthly, um, not generally monthly, and um, yeah. So that's that's something that we've we've been venturing into. And as Eli had mentioned, we are still working on the tool, but it is completely workable. It's definitely it's we are open to hearing feedback of things that we could do better, and just so that we can all be better moving forward in this space. Um, so. We, um, next next slide, please. So thank you definitely for listening and just attending this session. We appreciate you. And we appreciate any effort that you are making to advance this movement. Um, we have some time for questions. So please um, feel free to drop them in the chat and we will answer them as best as we could. Just uh, real quick to respond to some questions that uh, I just saw in the chat. Um, so I uh, was asked if um, this is going to be available in other languages um, or if we can get it translated. Um, to be perfectly honest, I had not considered that at all. And that's a great point. So this is why this community engage, this community input is very, very helpful. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I'll actually um, look into uh, a way we can get this translated um and, and available to a wider audience i i see a question that i can answer um that um this is for frederick banks um from nde yes okay so the question is do you ask how residents feel about their block that is a great question as well. So as Eli said, you know, we are definitely open to feedback. We can we can go back to the drawing board and uh, try to include that because that is essential, especially because that's one of the first questions I ask all of you. How do you feel about your block? What are you seeing? What are things you like? What are things you would like to change? So maybe that could be incorporated in the 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 first the first or second page of the survey before the actual um, assessment is that has started. I think that's a good question. Um, Eli, can you would you be able to answer the the um, is it J Janet? Janet, Janet, I'm so sorry, Miss Graham, or oh, I'm I, Janet. Okay, so the question is, 
is there a criteria for food banks on my block and churches? Um, yeah, there is. There is for food banks. I actually just checked, and I honestly I missed the churches one. Uh, it should be in the public services. So I. Uh, um. So, but yes, I, it it will be included just shortly after you. If you continue using the app for the next um, week, you're going to see improvements and changes over the over the coming week as we incorporate the feedback. And just moving on to another question from Frederick. Um, can app users see results from their block or look at other block survey results? Yep. And um, as I, I might have mentioned that the um, the value of this tool um, is going to be in uh, using um, this in conjunction with uh, uh, another product we are or tool we're creating or we have created and we're just updating called the MDEJ screen, which will allow um, residents to kind of include this information and uh, environmental justice information into their perspective of their community and allow for more um, uh, more precise engagement. Um, fire department and EMS are there as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good to know. OK, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Janae uh, mentioned adding the vacant housing into housing. And demographics as well. OK. The, um, the challenge is for this information is to keep it um, keep, to make it so that the the users can uh, they're not revealing any personally identifiable information, which is why demographics isn't isn't really included. Um, uh, because if you if you have somebody's location um, and personal information about you know their demographics, it's not terribly difficult to assess who is who that individual is. Um, um, oh. Did we lose Eli? We may have. Uh, disappeared for was asked um, if the app was accessible to um, it's going to be accessible for other researchers to use. Um, yeah, the, it will. Uh, so the um, format it's going to be ex be able to be exported in. Um, uh, if you're familiar with these terms mm -hmm. as CSV, um, comma separated values and um, shape files, um, which would allow for users to be able to project the data um, and manipulate it how they they would like um, on their own with their own tools, um, whether it's QGIS or ArcGIS um, or you know, even Google Maps at this point allows you to do that. Um, the more uh, engagement we have with the with the data, and honestly, the you know, in terms of users adding information, and in terms of um, users kind of leveraging that information on their own, uh, will immensely help the development of the tool going forward like it's it cannot be understated um because the the tool is is generally for the the community members and so while um it does while it does allow for um people to like for researchers to to gather that high level data it's um important to make sure that the context is still being preserved and the context is the community the block um and adding Adding to um, the question that was asked uh, regarding if it will be accessible for researchers to use, um, we have shared with um, different groups, different organizations, um, maybe two or three so far, um, and they have been using it um, with their own research projects. Um, specifically, one is 
focusing on um, using um, youth, um, young people, younger people, I should say, um, and um, kind of monitoring their physical, their physical um, activity in addition to where they live, um, their block, of course, and also adding um, air quality monitoring to that specific project and seeing how all of these things combined are affecting um, the this specific community of um, young people. So that that's a project that's being um, worked on. Um, so we have shared the tool with um, that um, partner and essentially we are open to um, seeing how we can work um, in work together with someone um, else on another project that they would need, um, another project that they can see this being useful. Um, Janae had asked if schools are going to be included. Um, yes, the number of schools are included. Um, we don't ask for the individual school names, though. Um, and, and it's Completely fine. You have many questions. Uh, this Absolutely. all of this feedback is very, very, very helpful. No problem. Thank you for your questions. These were really, really great. Yeah. Um, so I just really wanted to. Well. Also wanted to talk about um, the next steps um, for those tools. So the um, as as we mentioned, this is the um, how do you think it would long to take? Uh, how long do you think it would take a typical street assessment to take? Um, I honestly don't know. In fact, that's a question that I would love for you guys to answer for me. Um, it does not take me long to throw dummy data into the um, into the survey, but that's not really helpful in this scenario. Yeah. Um, um, I think it's dependent. I think it's dependent on what your block actually looks like, you know? So I, I think it could range maybe from example, if you live in a neighborhood where your block, I should say, if your block is, is just not there's not as like many things to report or you see a, a, like a high amount of salutogens in your neighborhood, you know, maybe it depends. I think it just depends on where you live. So there may be more things to add, more data to, to log, depending on your area. So that, that question might be a little tricky because um, as Eli said, you know, if he adds data, it could be, it could range from a different space versus if I add data versus if you add data. So that might be, yeah, that might be a, a, a just dependent on the individual using it. I would say, like the for for recruitment and planning, I would I would emphasize that it's not necessary to complete the entire survey for it to be valuable. Um, so you know, if you're picking up your kid from school and you're waiting outside for five minutes. Um, it's, you know, that's plenty of time to fill out as much information as you as you can conceive. Um, the, um, the like I said, the only thing that's really necessary is the geography. Um, without that, it's it, it, there's no reference point, obviously. So, but um, Uh, anyways, I, I wanted to just quickly touch on um, some next steps for the tool. Um, so some changes you're going to see um, in the coming months as we finish development. Uh, so uh, like Ariel said, this is going to we're going to um, publish this as an as a standalone app. Um, so not just as a browser app, but as something you can just throw on your your smartphone or your device and kind of fill out on your way. Um, the data will be, um, once, when it's launched, the data will be publicly available as soon as you hit submit. Um, there won't be any processing time. So once you hit submit, um, it'll, it'll be up there. Uh, so if you, uh, you know, make any, make any glaring, any big mistakes, uh, just make sure you do it before then. 
uh, before you hit submit and you can go back and fix it. Um, like I said, it's not, it, everybody's going to make mistakes when doing this. So it's not really so much a, you don't have to be as um, particular and persnickety about getting every single detail right, just so long as you get um, as much right as possible. And um, like I said, if you can't fill out the whole thing, that's perfectly fine. We're going to be able to layer concurrent surveys, um, which basically just means that as you're walking around your neighborhood, you can just keep hitting new survey, you know, get your location and just fill it out. When you hit to the next block, you can just hit the new survey button again. Um, and you don't have to submit it right up there. Um, and then, as I mentioned, this is all going to be ported onto the MDEJ screen map. Um, and so that's going uh, to be launched. Um, the final version of that is going to be launched first. Uh, oh, I think uh, the timeline is at the end of September. Um, and then this will be kind of added on as a supplement data source to that. Um, we all we are also working on um, some community engagement materials as well um, to have that in like to supplement the tool. So it's it's easier to kind of um, be able to push that forward so that people can um, have a better understanding of not just receiving a tool and being like, what's happening? So that's something we've also been working on um, in these next steps to ensure that people have that um, to go off of, to reference, I should say. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, so with that being said, um, thank you all for attending this session. Um, we appreciate you and we appreciate you wanting to learn more and all the work that you are already doing in this space of environmental justice and climate change and health disparities. Um, oh, okay, sorry, we have one more question from Alice Sung. I believe, um, well, you can probably get that one again, Eli, but it might be helpful to to repeat it. Have you seen it? Sorry. Oh, we can yeah. hear you. you. You made it. Sorry about that. Um, Alice was asking what the data was intended for. Um, so ultimately, it's intended just to, to give community members a more holistic perspective of their block and their neighborhood in general. Um, and uh, to have that included in environmental justice work going forward. Will the app be available for other cities or states? It's not um, It's not centralized, centralized to um, Maryland. Um, you can use it anywhere. Um, the, for the MDEJ screen, um, which is the, what our intended purpose is for this data, um, it won't, if you, you know, use it outside of Maryland, it won't, that data won't show up on our map, but that data will still be publicly available. And so if other communities around the country want to outside of Maryland or, or anywhere else for that matter, want to use it, they're free and clear too. Any more questions? Feel free to ask this question, um, Alice. Oh, I can put my email in the chat. I can put it in the chat and hopefully, and if you have any questions, that's no problem. We can we can connect on that, Alice. We could further speak on that um, by email. Oh, I sent the wrong thing.
Um, if you have any further questions or um, any thoughts, you know, feel free to um, contact me via email. Uh, it's been added to the chat, the comments. So yes, definitely feel free to reach out. Um, yeah. Okay, so if we are done with questions, if there are no more, um, once again, thank you so much for coming in and joining us in this session. Um, we hope you've been enjoying the conference thus far, and um, we hope you enjoy the rest of the sessions for the rest of the day and for tomorrow as well. Um, thank you again. Um, have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone.